So today we're going to be painting the midsection of the painting. Now yesterday I did not put up an additional painting. I put up the painting that I was supposed to put up the night before. And if you're already confused, so am I. Join the club. The painting was a very long uh, video. It was much longer in reality, but I didn't think releasing 180 minutes worth of me chitter chattering was interesting to anyone. Um, so I actually put out a video that was an hour and 18 minutes long. So those of you who want a short movie, it's up online. A bunch of people have watched it. I also did a compressed high speed version of it that was about a little, over, little under four minutes long. It contained no audio, it was just me doing the painting. I'm going to try to release things in that format in the future because some people don't want to hear you chin wag forever, they just want to watch the painting be created. And other people, they're like, oh, what's the crazy guy talking about this week? And they want to hear about it. So I am going to talk about my ideas about this stuff and whatnot in a long video, but there will be a short video. Uh, again, like I said, we're not going to rush through this painting because we want it done right. So if this is ready for the Sunday, it will go up on auction. If it's not, it's going to wait. It's more important for me to be able to share something fun with you guys than just keep putting stuff for, up for auction. And it's not like we can't use the money because believe me, you guys have helped out in levels you will, I don't know if you'll ever understand. I'm not going to break down and cry, but to lose everything the way we did to have, and so many people have had it worse than us really worse than us uh, but to go from just being there to go right face first in the dirt the amount of people that have come forward and helped and you got to know this without your help without people who are who love us and care for us you know uh, you know like my aunt Mary you know, Larry's been huge holy shit he's amazing um, you know our friends at Coven's Cottage you know uh, we, we've got people um, Gabby Thorpe uh, Big thank you. Um, Crystal and Evan. Crystal and Evan, yeah. Uh, the wife's in the background. Um, oh, God, yeah. Dude, we had people like the unbelievable. I, I, I give you my word uh, that when we get this up and running, you will be sharing in this. And we will make sure, as we already were going to, that good things happen for other people, too, because that's how you fix shit is uh, through volunteerism, and I, I love that. So, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to gush about that. It's, it's, it's heavy shit, you know. Um, and people are like, well, you gotta make money and you wanna buy a farm, put more stuff up for auction. Look, it is, it's very important to me that I do that, but it's almost more important that you understand what we're doing and what the vision is, and I talk a little bit about that while I'm doing this. So, um, an update on the farm that we were gonna be helping out. Uh, they wouldn't return any calls or messages or nothing. Um, and I even had my cousin, Ange, who works in the town they're in, uh, was going to go over and talk to them. And uh, my friend Melissa, uh, a follower and a tagger in this on social media from the South Shore of Massachusetts, you need to know this person. Uh, Melissa Make It Simple, she does food mood. She, she basically, she's a culinary wizard who connects people uh, with all these flavors and ideas and, and concepts around food that make life better. And uh, she's really talented. Then she had, uh, she creates businesses like I Create Landscape. She can do it like that and she's brilliant. And she offered her assistance, especially online help, and she offered volunteer time and I offered to volunteer raising money and they basically told everyone that like, no, we're good. So apparently, even though they have to raise tens of thousands of dollars in very little time, they're fine. Hey, whatever, you know, just because you ran into a roadblock doesn't mean there aren't other people you can help. So when I get done with this one, I'm still looking into a few other farms that I know people are trying to sell and I wish I could afford them, but I can't. Um, I want to get, like, kind of generate awareness for them to hopefully get those farms in the hands of good people. Uh, Honestly, every time I see land developed into something that isn't producing healthy food and helping the environment, my soul dies a little bit, and that's no joke. Um, as I'm explaining what we're doing here, I'm explaining what we're doing on the farm, and you may understand this over time as to what it is we're looking to do, but that's kind of abstract. Um, look, enough of my chin wagon. Thank you all for what you did. I couldn't post yesterday because of the sleep apnea thing and I just hadn't slept. So today we're painting, we're gonna try to get some of this mid-ground done. Again, two different formats. There'll be a high-speed video, there'll be this. And uh, when this is ready, we'll put this up for our auction. Thank you all. I hope you're getting outside. I hope you're enjoying some fresh air. I hope that you're letting your spirit 
feel light. Um, charge your batteries, charge your mitochondria, get out in the sun, don't get burned. Uh, we're gonna need this for the winter ahead. And if you can smile at others, if you can share any joy, do it. Right now, people need that more than anything else. Uh, even the dumb ones who can't think for themselves, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, it's important to do that. It's important to take care of yourself. And thank you for letting me share this with you. And without further ado, here we go. All right, so for today, that falls, I get this little spray bottle that I keep thinner in. That's gonna fall at some point, it always does. <laughs> so what we're working on, we're gonna work on the midsection. Uh, this is the field. And last time we got the misty mountains in. Uh, we got our clouds, we got our sky. It's black and gray because that's what needs to happen until it gets its color. Uh, now we're working in the midsection. So I've got a few different brushes that people like, what, what do you like to use? Today, to give you an idea of what I use to do this stuff, this is gonna hurt your brain. That's it. See anything spectacular here? I don't need anything fine. I got a brush for fine pointed stuff. I've got brushes to do like chiseled edges. Most of this stuff is just a way to get you to spend money on things that you really don't need. What we're trying to do is put pigment onto a surface and smear pigment around until it gets the consistency that we want. That's it. Whatever method gets you to that point. Um, we do have texture in the sky where it was necessary to get the clouds to stand forward from the background, but not too much. We're very careful about that. So now we've got our field, we've got our hedgerow in the distance, we've got our trees next to our farmhouse, we've got our trees over here. So for today, well, that's what we're decorating. Um, I don't have a rhyme or a reason as to how I like to work left or right on these things. My brain wants me to start here because I started there last time, so I'll probably do that. <clears throat> so, And when it comes to this, uh, there's almost no, I, I don't have a direction necessarily, like a lot of these things, you're looking at it and you're letting it happen as it needs to, and when you don't like something, you change it. Pretty straightforward. I usually spend the first few minutes of any painting doing indecise things with my hands because I can never figure out what I want to pick up first. And uh, there's really no right answer, I guess. There's no right answer at all. So, start with our trees. Now, the trees itself, this is, you gotta picture nighttime. If you go outside at night and you look at, um, you're looking at a, a, a group of trees, there's not much information you're really gonna get. It's nighttime, unless light is hitting it, there's not much going on. Uh, we also want to be careful when we're painting trees or anything at night that we're not giving too much information, which sounds insane, but light produces information. Light, the Victorian idea of light is that it's literally knowledge. So light cascading down, hitting an object, bouncing back, feeding us information to our retinas. Um, if there isn't much light and the moonlight really isn't that powerful, you're not getting that crisp detail. If you go out at night and you stare at a distant tree, you kind of get a general idea of what's going on, but it's, it's elusive. The more crisp you make it, the more it's not a distant object and it's not nighttime. So the tendency is to want to make it specific and refined, and the reality is, is that most of those things are not doing you any favors when it comes to making distance objects at night. I talk about this, actually I'm going to study my surface. I talk about this as if you're going to be painting. Because I genuinely assume that at some point you will. You don't have to, but I'm assuming you're going to. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is I've got some of my dark, and for underpaintings, I, I can use a little bit of black because it is a underpainting. Um, again, or I sometimes mix like deep, deep, deep blues and uh, 
I'll mix up an extremely dark green or a dark brown, and that'll make a color that is so close to black or so dark that it's hard to tell what it is. So I've got some dark on here. I really first want to see how dark it is. That's pretty dark. It doesn't look like it to you guys, but on a gray scale, that's at least a, like a four or even a five. It's, it's, it's center out, it's pretty dark. So I gotta think about that because if I go too dark, it's gonna give it form and I really don't want that much form. Let's go a little lighter, shall we? A little lighter. Now I've got the side of the tree that is kind of facing the moon. I'm shying away from it right at the moment. I'm using a very dry, bright brush. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing paint around. I'm not layering paint on right now. I'm not interested in that. The reason why I'm not is I, I don't, I just don't want to, I don't want this to be too hard of a surface. I don't want it to be too structured of a thing. I want it to just be. I'm also overlapping that halo I put around the tree. Remember the halo I talked about that the moon causes? I'm working with that halo right now. Some people would hate the fact that their easel is bouncing. I, I don't really pay attention to it. It's not the end of the world. I kind of like a little bit of a bounce. It's kind of like canvas, but without the soft surface, it has a bounce. Your tendency with stuff like this is to make it look however you think it's supposed to look. Like, that doesn't look real enough, whatever that means. Like People's tendency is they have an idea about what this is supposed to look like, but if they don't listen to their own voice and say, hey, this, is, this thing's supposed to go here, or that's supposed to go there, then they always wonder, oh, is that right? I can't tell you what's right. I can tell you what works and what doesn't. If you're doing something and it works, great. Now, remember I said I was going to show you if I made mistakes. I don't like where this tree is going. I'm not happy at all. So, remember I said you can take it to zero. This is why we paint in layers. Thinner on a rag, kids. And we're back to zero. Don't ever do that unless you're sure your paint's dry. <laughs> That'll be a sad day. And yes, we've all done it. So, I was already unsure about how, what direction that was going in. I didn't enjoy it, so I've omitted it. A little bit darker is gonna work. I'm going to start with the far side of the tree. I don't care to copy photographs. I'm not interested for the most part, especially when it comes to a landscape. And I understand copying a photograph if you're limited and that's all you have, then by all means make something beautiful and original. And, or, or you're trying to copy something to preserve it for antiquity. You're trying to help people recover a memory of a lost loved one. But don't, don't just think that's art. That's, that's copying is not it. There's more to it. You know, a printer can copy things. Doesn't mean any. Doesn't mean the printer's got skill. Doesn't mean the printer has talent. So right now, I'm working out three-dimensional structure of this tree. Um, when you paint, you're kind of thinking in very broad terms. And one of the things you're thinking about is overall tone and shape. You do not need to make everything look perfect the first time. There's room for error, there's also room for adaptation, but in a painting it's way more believable if your colors, uh, your tones are correct, than whether or not your tree is the right shape or something.
The human brain doesn't see reality, it sees what it thinks it sees. One of the dangerous things about humans and how they see the world is however their premise defines how they see the world is how they see the world, not how the world truly is. It gets you in dangerous, dangerous areas, because then you start thinking, well, why isn't the world that way? I'll force it. I can use technology to force it. Yeah, that might not be the best solution. That could backfire, I think. Like if you use technology to make a Monsanto type thing. I don't know. I don't know much about it. I'm just, I feel like you should work with nature, not against her. Now if I'm going on how this might look on a moonlit night, I'd say I'm pretty close right now.
So I'm chiseling back in near this tree because it's overtaking everything and I need it to step back a little bit. So I'm pushing some gray into where it is. I've got this fog. Fog is rolling in. into the mountain, near the trees. This technique is wet on wet. And what we're trying to do is to get this fog to pick up some of the moonlight here. I can get detail into this stuff, but I can't do it. So basically, so I've got this fog coming in. I want to kind of model, break up the tree a little bit. Fog coming in. Moonlight's catching some of it. kind of a flat area, but since I've got material going up in front of it, it's not that big of a deal. Definitely got the right, starting to develop the feel for it. So now we're so rescued the background area. Now we're going to put in a tree in here. I didn't know what was going on. I had to check. We're about halfway point. Fucking hardcore kid. Come on, suck it up, Taylor. Let's go. Whole tattoo at once. Come on. Yeah, fuck that. So 
now I'm starting to put my hedgerow uh, back in. So in the distance, uh, especially in fog, you're not gonna get much detail. Things kind of poke out of it. And the closer something gets to you, unless the fog's really thick, the more detail it has. So in order to demonstrate that, I am putting in detail in small amounts where I think it is appropriate. I'm also omitting it where it's not appropriate. Uh, that was good. I felt like you were thinking about it just for a second. It's almost as if you were pontificating. You can see distance now. It's one of the things I really want in there is distance. So I'm gonna take the brush I was just using. It has a little bit of paint on it. I'm gonna dry it off. And I'm gonna very gently just kinda of crush these hard shapes in the background. Because remember, we're looking through fog. There shouldn't be hard shapes back here unless it's something that's really in focus and this is not in focus. So we're just knocking it down a little. Okay. So go back in. I want to pull out some very distant shapes. Fog's very heavy over here. You wouldn't see them over there, but maybe back in here we'll Make some stuff in. Here and there a tree. You kind of get a sense that there is a forest maybe back there. You know? I read a book a few years ago, my friend Zach got me into it, and it talked about how the uh, English used the New World uh, at first to harvest trees for ship masts, and the white pine uh, was literally king among them. My friend Monk pointed this out to me a few weeks ago. I mean, I think we all knew it instinctively, but until he said it out loud, I was like, not, it just didn't occur. When people use the phrase like King Pine, they're actually talking about the King's Pines. So the white pine was, um, it, it grows really tall and it's really, it's an incredible tree. And the Northeastern United States, New England, at one point in time was completely coated in these things. Uh, to the extent that they actually changed the environment and the weather. Um, if you could fi picture like just millions of acres of these giant, giant majestic trees. Um, and they're over 150 feet in height, which <laughs> just makes everything 
for the most part, that isn't old white pine growth in the northeast look a little bit quaint. You know, no joke type stuff. And uh, these things would help the climate have its own weather pattern just because they were present. I mean, that's how massive these trees were. Uh, and they talked about how, like, you could even, uh, you'd have oxen trying to uh, haul these things out and the tree would shift and 16 oxen weighing like 3,000 pounds a piece would get thrown up in the air and brought down and their backs would be broken just trying to move it and just give you an idea of how big they were. You know, people always think of giant trees and the first thing they think of are the redwoods of California, but there are actually other giant trees in the United States that don't get as much attention and are just as relevant, if not more so. And our pines up here in the Northeast were part of it, not just your regular pine, like I mean real hardcore trees. And one of the things that's kind of sad to me is that is that people don't understand that their forests are now choked to shit. Everything is, uh, excuse my language, but everything is, is overgrown and it's potential fire hazard. People think the woods are supposed to be this choked mess of growth. And if you go into any New England forest, you can see it. You can just see, you can see all these dead standing trees just sitting there waiting for a lightning strike, waiting for something. People are like, yeah, it's the forest. They're supposed to look like that. No, they're not. You know, you're supposed to work with nature. You can harvest those trees because if you don't, traditionally wildfire would have done it. And someday wildfire will do it again. And they're battling fires right now out in Western Mass. It only takes one good lightning strike or one good storm and something to catch, and then you've got a problem that you're not going to be able to fix very easily. So in any case, I'm putting these... And it's actually a funny side note. Um, when I grew up, uh, the first few years of my life, and then right kind of down the road from where I lived for a lot of it, my grandparents' house had a white pine behind it that was so tall that you could see it from streets away. I could locate my grandparents' house just by looking for this tree. And I mean a distance. And a lot of people are like, yeah, I got trees like that. We live out in Colorado. Well, let me tell you, in New England, you don't have trees like that very often. There are not many trees that pick, poke up above the canopy so high that you can identify them at distance. That's rare. And we could do that with these. And it was a white pine. And my cousin Brian used to climb this tree. It shouldn't surprise anybody that that man went into the military and excelled at it. Because he was, a, he's definitely an, he's an alpha personality if there ever was one. He's a great human being. My, one of my first friends, one of my dearest friends and family, somebody that just, it's good that they're in the world, you know? But he used to climb that tree, holy shit. I, I don't know, it was, it was the scariest thing in the world to watch him do that. I never had the courage. And then, in the mid 80s, would have been around 84, um, we had moved back in with my grandparents temporarily, and there was a massive thunderstorm, big lightning storm, and uh, it was so loud. You know, you get one of those big summer boomers that just shake the house, and so, I had been asleep, and I, of course, I don't sleep well, and we didn't know I had sleep apnea at the time, so there was no logic as to why that would have woken me up, but it did, you know, other than that, it's scary, and I went downstairs just because I, I, my gut response when I was very little, when I lived there, was to go downstairs, and I, I can tell you stories about that, but, and they're, they're not bad, but, like, I went downstairs to see what was going on, and in the hall of my grandparents' house was my grandmother. Um, and anybody who knows me can tell you, my grandmother, patriarch of the fa matriarch of the family, she, my grandmother was sacred. She's a sacred human being. Uh, she, was, she was as good as the day is long, the salt of the earth, and one of the most accepting and caring human beings I have ever met in my life. 
uh, really, really unbelievable, like amazing human being. And she was standing in the hallway in the middle of my grandparents' house. And uh, she just rosary in her hand, just doing the rosary. And I used to, when I was a little kid, I used to love to do the rosary with my grandmother. I have some of her rosary beads now. I have some of my grandfather's. And when I'm sad or I'm stressed, if I have that on me and I remember, I will do the rosary. Which is funny <laughs> because I am a heathen. <laughs> It brings me great joy, and I, you know, it doesn't match with everybody's beliefs, but I just kind of added Jesus to my heathen pantheon of gods, like him and the Blessed Mother. I like them a whole bunch. They, they get they get points in my book, so. His dad, that's a different discussion, but Jesus himself, fan, like him. Um, so she's in the hall, and she's, you know, she's praying the rosary, good Irish Catholic, just standing there, waiting for her end. <laughs> in other words, I come downstairs and she's got to put on a brave face for me. Uh, I'll never forget, like, she she had put on her sweater over her bathrobe. My grandmother wore the same outfit every day of the week for her entire life. Brown skirt, pantyhose, sensible flat shoes, white button-down blouse, white cream sweater, didn't matter if it was the middle of January or the middle of August. And when she gardened, she used to wear white gloves on top of that. It was, in, I looked like I was gonna have heat stroke watching her do this. So she's downstairs in the hall, she's praying the rosary and I show up and uh, you know, she, she asked me if I was okay and I said, uh, I'm a little nervous and uh, you know, we'll be all right, right? And she goes, you know, and she told me this, and I think it's kind of a very Viking idea, but I keep it to this day. She said, you know, the good Lord will take you when it's your time, and that's it. And if it's not your time, you're not going anywhere. And if you go somewhere, he's taking you. Either way, you're in good hands. And I was like, well, this woman died giving birth to my mother. She's the toughest human being I know because she puts up with my grandfather. <laughs> and uh, she is the level-headed one, so I'm going to go with whatever she just said is dead-on accurate. And I was fine with it. And uh, I didn't know until years later how truly horrified she was by that storm. So while we're hanging out in the, uh, in the downstairs hall, lightning struck the white pine out back. Dead-on. It just hit it. This tree was so big and so strong that the lightning split it midway down the side and half the tree fell over and crashed into the earth. And we had branches that must have been 15, 20 feet long at least that were driven straight down into the earth and we never got them out. If you were to excavate her yard and you were to go dig in there, there would be sections of tree that are still breaking down that who God only knows how far they'd go. I mean, it just it literally drove them into the ground. The tree didn't fall over though, like the rest of the tree stayed up and alive. The lightning traveled down the tree, across the yard, into the cellar and it hit the hot water heater and blew that thing to bits. It shook the whole house like a goddamn bomb going off. And it was kind of what it was. I mean, it was really, you know, you think about what you what I'm describing, that's it's basically, an, it's an explosion. And uh, it decimated it, it was amazing. And she never lost her composure, and she never broke down. And as soon as that happened, you know, the, the lightning hits and the whole house shakes, and uh, the explosion happened, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and she's got her arms around me, and she goes, are you okay? And I go, yeah. She goes, that was a big explosion, wasn't it? <laughs> or she said something like, that was exciting. And I was like, what? Like, yeah, that was exciting, wasn't it? She's like, well... We're okay then. It's gone. It's not our time. And I was like, that works. I like that. I like that honesty. I don't like when adults go, everything's going to be fine. And you know deep down inside, you're like, you don't know that shit. I like when they're up front and they go, eh, ah, shit could go backwards quick. I'm like, and don't worry. I'll be stoic and we'll get through this. And sure enough, we did. And then years later, they cut that tree down, which was kind of sad, but. You know, that tree 
uh, enters into my consciousness all the time. And uh, later in life, when uh, I, you know, in the 90s, and I started hearing about the uh, the system of the Kabbalah, and uh, this is before Madonna. <laughs> I have to clarify that. My friend Tannen from Bones and Flowers got me into it. And uh, she said, this is how this works. And I was like, there's a lightning bolt that comes down the tree and the serpent goes up the tree. I feel like I've experienced this. So that's abstract for you. It's just me talking about things. I'll never forget that lightning strike, man. Holy shit, that shook the house. To this day, I am unfazed by lightning. I find it invigorating and exciting. My wife does not different strokes for different folks. She probably has more common sense than I do. I think that's a given. But realistically speaking, like, I feel it's like that Viking attitude. You know, I, I like, there's a movie called The 13th Warrior, which is kind of hokey, but it's great. I think it's great, and I think the book it's based off of by Crichton, Eaters of the Dead, is really good. But I would say, if you're gonna read one of these things, or watch one of these things, watch, watch The 13th Warrior first. Because when you finally want to read Eaters of the Dead and realize what a shit movie uh, <laughs> 13th War is going to ruin it for you. But like, if you can suspend disbelief and just enjoy that little moment in time, that, that movie, it's a great movie. And in that movie, the attitude that I saw in my grandmother is reflected in the characters. Um, and at one point in the movie... Uh, the character played by Antonio Banderas is, uh, he looks nervous and uh, he, they're talking about this insurnable, uh, ins unstoppable foe that's going to kill everybody and one of the Norsemen says, you know go and hide in a hole if you like your fate is fixed you will not live one instant longer Fear profits man nothing. I get choked up when I say it because I think about my grandma and how fucking hardcore she was. And uh, I think it's a true statement. So that's something I remembered a few years ago. I was always afraid of flying. And then one day I realized, I'm like, if I go down on this thing and I'm sad and I'm scared, then... I spent the last few minutes of my life being afraid. And I decided after that that I had survived so many bad things that I was like, no, no, man, get in there and kiss your fear on the mouth. Don't you be afraid of it. If you're going to meet your end, laugh the whole way, because at some point, the end is coming. You're not laughing anymore, so get your laugh in while you can. the white pine you can actually supposedly and I've never seen this but supposedly you can go up to places in New Hampshire where they have old old growth uh, places where they marked the white pine with the king's mark which is a chevron pointing upwards um, and they have the white pine and supposedly there are some of them you can actually still see the axe mark that made that mark it's now like 30, 40 feet up a tree. The tree's gigantic, but that was an original mark made to designate that this belongs to the king. It is his tree. And you can't cut it. Although, thankfully, sometime around the late 1700s, we put their, our foot solidly in their ass and it became our tree. I'm hoping at some point in time we realize that we're responsible for taking care of the tree <laughs> as opposed to just owning the fucking thing. Kind of be important to take care of it. Which doesn't mean don't use it, but respect it, have old growth, nurture old growth. If you don't have old growth forests for your children to go dream about time and ideas, then you're fucking up. That's a fact. starting to get fog in here, this is good. So yeah, so the white pine, and I wanted some, these majestic pines, and I wanted them to be kind of ungodly huge, because that's what they are, they're just massive. So here's your little farmhouse, and here's your, for lack of a 
better word, great big effing tree. And I like them. Something about them makes me happy. I make up stories about these trees. You know, you ever bring a kid out and they see, wow, look at how big that tree is. I'm like, well, you know how we start broccoli in the greenhouse and then we transplant it? Yeah, well, that's how this tree got here. That's, that's exactly what was happening. Remember the old man in the mountain in New Hampshire and he fell down? Well, he didn't fall down. He went to go plant some more white pines. He just got up one day and he said, yeah, I've had a good nap. What was that, 10,000 years? I'm going to go make some white pines. And he went and transplanted some white pines. He's on vacation. He's probably some sort of a troll. A six-year-old will believe that. An adult might not, but they believe in an invisible guy who lives in the sky and judges them on their bad behavior, so I figure we might as well add a giant to the mix and make it interesting. I like the idea of giants. I think they're cool. Actually, giants play into our agricultural plan for a farm. I gotta find, uh, I just gotta get an old cow and then find somebody to sell the cow to that's got some of those magic beans. And as soon as I figure out the magic bean situation, we can grow that regeneratively, of course. I can climb that stock and go talk to one of the giants about maybe, you know, better representation of the public, see if we can get the old man in the mountain to come back down and take his place again. Yep. I'm giggling inside. So, we got our white pine, we got some of our distant stuff, we got to move across the bottom here, so I'm grabbing my, uh, my gray tones. And people go, well, where do you decide where this thing goes or that thing goes? I put things where they make me happy. This is, this is an art form that is completely, it's open to whatever you want. Why not make it that? So, I'm working on this hedgerow here. I want there to be a little bit of vegetation. I want the vegetation to be a bit vague. Keeping this light gray over here. Kind of. You want definition, but it's so distant, you really don't want too much. Um, then I'm going to go back into it with something a little bit darker. Layers. Layers and layers and layers. Unlike chickens, which are layers, but not the right kind for what we're doing. See how it starts to come into the background? It's starting to become real. Like the velveteen rabbit. I bet there's some velveteen rabbits in here. Little bits, little bits, not a whole lot. Let that feedback loop happen. I, I feel like, I'm gonna make a general statement, I feel like if human beings applied the same logic to the feedback loop they can achieve in a painting to their interactions with other human beings, life would make a lot more sense. If you pay attention to what makes people happy and pisses people off, you've got half the equation right there. And that is a fact, Jack. See, this tree right here is a little too, uh, a little too contrasty. We're gonna press down on him. Just pull up a little bit of that color. Now he's reasonable again. Oh. 
Okay, now as we go over this way, I've got the idea that there might be more deciduous trees on the right side. I've got all these conifers on the left, and I've got conifer-like shapes. So I'm thinking deciduous tree is kind of the direction I want to go next. Don't be afraid to put your paint down. Pick up your mall stick. This is for steadying. I use this in weird ways. You know, I'll make a bridge with my hand and my foot, staple the stick, and now I've got a steady drawing surface to make lines on. This brush is probably too big for what we're going to accomplish. This brush might be right. Okay. Okay. All right. So, if you're going further away and you need detail, keep in mind that this detail and this detail are very different things. These are different sizes. That's a very thin brush. Um, while we're not going to see detail, she must, she must put that on the can on the board. That was good. Um, we don't need a lot of detail, but we need little bits. So I'm going to imagine that back here somewhere is a tree. I'm also going to imagine that I actually put paint on this damn thing. Because that always helps. Um, too dark. There we go. Don't think too much about what the shape of the tree really is. It almost doesn't matter. Trying to get it to look a specific way, you might be surprised that it doesn't do what you want. I make shapes until I've decided that I see a tree the way I want to see a tree, and then I stop. This little tree there. You can't tell much about this tree. His name is Harold. Um, as I know him, you don't. Just kidding. Uh, I'm going to put a shape next to Harold that suggests that Jill might be behind him. You got to watch out for her. She's always hanging out. But it doesn't need to be much. I'm actually just going to do almost the top of the tree. It's almost just like a brush shape. There's a tree and there's a tree. Now I'm going to go back into that first tree that I made. I'm going to start to smooth out some of that dark paint. I'm going to create more of a haze. I am 100% just information a little bit more information and i'm having an exchange of ideas with the surface i'm listening to it that's number two see i got trees over here and i want to bring one more in here so i'm leading you in and out of areas this is the difference between an actual landscape and a created landscape is that in this situation my goal is to actually communicate something about an idea with you. It doesn't have to be absolutely real. It doesn't have to be perfect. It has to just be what I want it to be. This is like doing creative. If you're a writer and you're doing creative writing, this is exactly it. It's your, it's your chance to make your thing. If you do the type of photography my wife does, you are setting up a scene. You're making art. You're just using a medium that works for you to create what you want to create. At no point in time are you restricted by the bounds and perimeters of reality. That is kind of neat. The other thing that the trees are doing in the way distant background is they're telling me the size of things. They came right up and they whispered into my ear, I'm this big. All right, I'm going back into that first tree I made with white. I'm taking it down a notch. It's a little bit much. It needs to go away just a bit. Otherwise, okay. Now, these trees look like they're behind the hedgerow. That's not wrong, but it may not be what I want. 
I might want to bring these trees in front of the hedgerow. That might make a lot more sense. How do you do that? The hedgerow's here, tree is there. Well, I'm gonna anchor it using light on the edge of the field. I'm gonna anchor the other one next to it. And all of a sudden those trees are not in the distance. They're, in, they're much closer. Starting to manifest. So, as we bring the trees forward, we're putting in more information. That's that's what this is. It's information. Little dots are information. That tells the viewer a little bit about what they're looking at. I feel like in this part of the painting, I want to allude to just a little bit more. Of maybe a orchard or something. This is what we got so far. Oh my goodness. Wow. It's coming on. Yeah. How you doing? I'm in fucking pain. I bet. I bet you are. Yeah. But God pushed through. What do you got left? Mm -hmm. Got the knee area. Oh, Jesus Christ on a cracker. Yeah. Those flowers near the back of your knee are going to be a mother fuck nut. Oh, damn. That looks really good. Look at how fucking clean those lines are, though. Right. Hell yeah. So these trees right here were suggesting an orchard, you know, maybe right at the edge. I kind of want to bring them up near these other trees that are right next to the house. The other thing that I'm using these for is size. So one of the things you can use with like depth in paintings is the size of, hold on, I'm going to wipe down our paint. The size of uh, objects and the detail at distance, uh, objects at distance gray out, they lose detail. Uh, if we want to show depth, we can show an object that's here, but also in the distance, and as it, it gets smaller as it goes away. It's not, it's not bad, it's not a bad way to do that. The other thing that's going to happen as we come forward is that the density of the objects will increase. Uh, it's not that they're not dense at a distance, but you have particles of air between you and the distant object, which can, it basically kind of tells you that there, you, there's, there's a space between you and the object. but. Distant objects usually have gray. They have more particles between them and you. Uh, light is bending around the particles, thus flattening the image. I'm going to cut this tree line a little short before we reach the house, because I really want to break between these things. I want the feel of fog. I gotta break that up.
Going back in, I'm flattening down some of those colors. I'm moving out material. And I am telling you about what's going on with paint. Trees back there. Again, I'm just adding a little bit at a time. You can almost imagine this tree line bumping into this other tree line. You can almost see it start to take place. So, it's rough back there, but it's starting to form. Uh, when I go in and I do this tree here, I do not want to just start putting in dark. It would be easy to do it. I want to selectively fill in some spots with a mid-tone. I know they're going to be a little too light. I do not want them to be that light. Like that. Let's make out a part of a tree right here, right? And you're also seeing the fog and the mist. The other thing about that movie, Thirteenth Warrior, is uh, the the they're they're fighting an entity they call the Vendor. And uh, you're left to believe that these are either leftover Neanderthal type people or a primitive group. Uh, according to the book, there were supposedly discoveries of. Neanderthals uh, in that part of the world that could have been around up until relatively recently. So I could see that as a possibility. I just think it's an interesting Beowulf type tale. It's really kind of neat. Um, but in the movie, the, the danger is that they come in the mist in the dark as if they could see in the black. Do they come on two legs or on four? Well, it seems they did both. That there's a man thing that was a both or the thing that was man and bear. I myself did not get a quick look at them. Saw the glow worm though, the last white. We all did. Oh, it's the movie, but the mist plays a role in it. In in many um northern European cultures, uh the mist is alive. Uh the Irish had a god for this, and they had rituals associated with it. The Celts, the Scots, all these different groups had these traditions that went along with this idea that you could find gateways or doorways to other realities in the mist. And you can see the trees starting to form here. And uh, there were rituals and gods devoted to it. Which is kind of, I think, sometimes hard for those of us who live in the modern world to even imagine why you would come up with such a strange tradition to tell stories like that. But when you see how strong and powerful these elements are, uh, not just in art, but in reality, when you see how potent mist is and what it can hide, and, oh, and how many times I get throw a brush, you realize that to people back in the day, it's not that they were stupid, it's that it really the mist was a dangerous thing, you know? If you were uh, if you were moving a boat into a harbor and there was mist and you were not careful, you could run aground and at a time where there was no one to come save you, that was a death sentence. You, you were not coming back. Uh, crash your boat off the coast, if you're five miles out, you might as well be a hundred, you might not be able to swim it in the icy waters of the North Sea, minutes in the water are death. Well, the mist is a place where those things hide. Uh, the mist also represents the consciousness, you know, so maybe we're talking about the subconscious, you know, what is in the mist. And uh, maybe, maybe ancient people weren't that stupid. Maybe they really did understand that you, um, you have to be careful of that stuff because the subconscious or the unknown has more potential than anything else. You should be very cautious of it and you should treat it with respect.
Although it sounds way cooler when you're battling like, you know, the glow uh, you know, uh, or, or demons from the abyss are, are way more interesting than there might be a rock. But I'm sure the people on the Titanic would tell you that the rock actually poses a bit more danger than the other stuff. Dude, that looks fucking unbelievable. Fly and slide, flex, flex, like line, line, line. Hardcore. Okay, so you remember me telling you about information at a distance? When you're when you're trying to control the sharp edges of things. This is my little, this is what I do. So I take a stubby brush that's kind of destroyed, short, hard bristles, a little firm, and I push directly down. And all I'm doing is I'm pushing the paint out. I'm just blurring it a little bit. Because at this distance, you're not gonna get too much information. You're really not. So if you're getting a lot of information, your brain starts to think, wait a minute, that's not really that far away, is it? But if it's getting little spurts of information, if it's getting little blinks on the radar, then you're more likely to go, well, okay, all right, that is that is missed. There is something there. Fill in the gap there. getting it. So in this one, I'm going to try something different. Like I said, a lot of this is me coming back to this, but I'm adding more dark to this tree right out the gate. I want to try to define some of it before I add any of the light. Now I'm gonna go for a light tone. And I'm looking at the background. I'm actually gonna go one notch above that. And I think here, and here, here. One of the other things that's kind of great about this part of the painting is that when you work in black and white to understand your tones, there's a less of a variable than doing that and color at the same time. You can be way more specific. Now, when you're doing color, you're matching the tone or the value plus the color. That's a lot of work. Like, you, you can end up with a very confusing thing very quickly. But when you work in black and white as a visual artist, you can only concentrate on what isn't color. You have to concentrate on tone. This is one of the great powers of underpainting is that you can get your tones kind of the way you want them. And then while you're adding real color, you're also adding glazes to try to get to that point. It's not quite just color, you know? Again, there's no reason to rush. Take your time. And I can also, because I'm working wet on wet at the moment, I can model down darks.
Yep. Grabbing some very light color. Using this light color to go around the tree. I am knocking down my brown, but even more importantly, I am filling up backspace before I hit this with lighter color. That way I don't have to worry too much of what the lighter stuff looks like because I've already dealt with it all as far as the tone. I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense to you. Like, so I know that the back of that tree needs to be light and hit with the moon and then I know I need, I need darker values in front of it. But if I try to put the lighter values over the darker values to make the edge, sometimes that backfires. So right now I'm actually using the lighter colors to kind of erase the, the brown so to speak, and then I'm gonna go in with the dark and make the tree. When I work like this, because I'm working in value scales, I have uh, four different pigments laid out. I'm gonna have to clean the brush now. I was gonna say, I don't always clean the brush right there, and then I had to because there was too much light on it. But I will go in and I will pull, and I'll mix colors as I pull, and I'll kind of just work back and forth across the palette. Ah, uh, there we go. Now I'm starting to fill in my tree on the outside. You can see the glow of the leaves hitting the moonlight, but it's not overwhelming. It's not like the main feature of the painting, you know? and I'm looking for my mid tones but I'm also looking for my mid leaves like what are the leaves that are kind of in the transition not quite silhouetted they're not quite that dark but what are the ones that are dark enough that make me go oh there's a tree there and I'll do it almost to the point where it's a silhouette I'll just keep hammering away at it until it's like a very monochromatic thing and then I'll gently go in with darker tones and I'll start to pull it even further out and then, great thing about oil paint, great thing about paint in general, I can go back in and I can hit the lighter spots and bend light around things. It's really kind of cool. Same thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Clean my brush off a little bit. You know, you can clean your brush off for different levels. I don't always clean it clean. I just wipe off the excess stuff. You mean paint? Yeah, whatever. Get a little bit more light. I'm actually going to go back into a few spots, and I'm just going to knock them back just a little. Just a bit softer. Maybe there's a little bit more moonlight creeping through these far branches. Not lighting the tree up like Christmas, but it is present. Maybe some of that light comes in here, comes in right there. You know, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I also think the light comes into these spots too. But remember, it's you, you got to fight yourself. You're like, oh, it's it's lit by the moon. It's got to be bright. No, remember, moonlight ain't that bright. I don't want to get too into the stuff in front of the roof because I'll just paint myself into a corner, literally. Can't go fix it. I got a Q-tip right here. Tear off the paint bit. All I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and remove some of this paint near the roof. I just didn't want that there right now. That's good. All right, now I gotta go grab my uh, 
I'm going to use a finer brush, my finer brush, and I'm going to start pulling in dark. Right there's this little pocket of the trunk, maybe. Some of the heavier leaves. We're going we're gonna to pull in the trunk here. I got some big bunches of leaves here. These are resistant light, big times. So they're definitely going to be dark. And I'll tell you, it's not quite right, but the closer I am to my light source here, the more I'm getting a silhouette. Whereas over here, I'm getting the light bouncing and kind of dip diffusing through the, the fog. That doing that over here, but it's not quite the same. I'm grabbing little bits of that dark. I'm stealing it to push in other parts of the tree. I'm just watching it. I'm not, I'm, I'm a little bit disassociating, not thinking too much about the work. I'll tell you an honest truth. Sometimes I allow my eyes to go out of focus while I'm doing this. And I don't even think about what I'm doing. I look past it and I just watch my hand make marks. We don't think about it at all. The interview with the vampire when, uh, I know some people hate that movie. I really loved it. Um, the interview with the vampire when he's, when he's changing Louie. And, uh, Lestat says to him, it's only your body that dies. Pay it no mind. It happens to us all. Love that. So many great bits of acting. It always makes me sad that people don't like that movie who are real, like hardcore, like Anne Rice fans, because the movie's not true to the book. But the acting's phenomenal. trying to rationalize the drinking of blood and uh, he explains to Louis God kills indiscriminately and so uh, and so shall we for no creature under God is so like he as we are ourselves it's an interesting idea I'm not saying I subscribe to it I just think it's interesting the other problem with nowadays is you can't say anything without people getting mad at you for how dare you. Hey look, I don't define your God. That's not my job. I'm just sharing what's in my mind. If you're offended, I apologize. It's not my intention. Right at the moment I'm more reminiscing about my youth than anything else. I've seen the movie Interview with the Vampire. I couldn't possibly tell you. I had a long, like we call it the long sexually inactive homosexual relationship. I had a friend of mine who we used to watch Interview with the Vampire almost every night for like six, seven months. We burned out two VHS copies. We watched it literally to death. We would hang out together, we'd go draw, and then we'd go to my house and would watch interview with the vampire together it was like friggin date night i think i was in a relationship with this person i just had no idea um i love interview with the vampire the vampires are so incredibly beautiful i love like i mean it doesn't hurt that they picked very attractive people like brad pitt and tom cruise but the fact that the contacts and the porcelain skin, it just looks insane. And then I really love uh, the second one, Queen of the Damned with Aaliyah. Holy crap, is that cool. They're like, that's not, that's the movie, with, that's the book Lestat, and that's this book. And I'm like, look, I, I don't, I, I, I know I'm supposed to give a shit, but I don't. I really don't. I just love this movie, and I think it's great. Yeah, it's not as good as the book. I know. But I'm a visual artist, and visual 
part really appeals to me. Also, actually, sometime in the last few months, we realized that the woman who does the voice for the hormone monstrous is in Interview with a Vampire. That's one of her big first roles. And she is the, uh, and I'm unfortunate, but she's the prostitute that gets killed right before uh, Lestat suggests to Louis that he could live on rats if he wanted to. There's our tree with our fog. I also love that movie when they, when, when they show, the, whoever the artist was who did the drawings for Claudia was magnificent. Oh, just beautiful and they're touring the Mediterranean. I had always wanted to come to our homeland. I wanted those waters to be blue, but they were black. Nighttime waters and how my heart suffered then. Probably have the line wrong, but man, that's a good movie. A little bit of that fog just creeping right across. Digging the heck out of that, boy. That is cool. Having fun. A little bit more fog up here, huh? What do you think, kids? I like to sometimes take this glow from the back of the tree and blur the edges of reality. Bring that right out into space with the nighttime clouds. How about that, huh? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, let's go with that. Sure. Kind of actually weird segue. So if you watch the interview with the vampire from the 90s, um, you know that Antonio Banderas does the, is Armand. Remember my name, Armand. Um, he's in The 13th Warrior. It's one of his first roles. I don't care what people think of Antonio Banderas. I think he's a brilliant actor. Uh, he, did in, he did The 13th Warrior phonetically. The man doesn't speak English when he does this role. And he does it just... He's brilliant. He's so good. Um, and in so in the 13th warrior it's it's required that he learn the language of the northmen uh in the movie he plays uh, a historical person uh even fadlan even hamad even rashid i'm sure i'm getting the name wrong my apologies um but he was uh the, the way the movie explains it is he was a um he was made an ambassador to the land of the Gisupla, a, a region far to the north. And uh, it's because he loved a woman who was married to another man. So he had caught the eye of the wife of the uh, magistrate or the caliph or whatever. Um, we don't really kind of get all the information from this, but it is because of Fadalan's work that and his description of uh, the Rus, uh, Swedish, Russian, uh, Viking mercenaries that we have an understanding of these people. And it is the only thing that he ever writes about that historians question, and yet they are left to believe that whatever he's saying must be true because he doesn't fabricate anything else. He believes very sincerely that it is his duty to um, God, uh, to his God that he be accurate in his representation of the world. So all of his writing, to the best of my knowledge, is pretty accurate stuff. Like he is talking about things as he understands them. But when he describes the roots, he describes a group of mercenary warriors and he gives them a number of, that if they the number at least five thousand strong, heavily armed. And the reason historians have a problem with this is well, quite frankly, that most armies didn't work like that. You didn't just have 5,000 dudes with heavy weaponry moving across country unchecked uh, because weapons are expensive and you don't want to be doing stuff like that. You get yourself into trouble. But Fadlan talks about this. And he talks about how 
this contingent is, uh, you know, doing it's on its way to go do some business or something. And it's abstract to him because from his culture, uh, people do not wander on their own. They do what is the bidding of their ruler or their caliph. I'm sure I'm pronouncing this all wrong, um, and I'm sure I get it a little bit backwards. But Fadlan described these guys as basically mercenaries, and now we know it's pretty accurate. Like, they'd sell their services to the highest bidder. We have places in the Middle East that have representations of the Vikings' um, runes uh, carved into temples and mosques. And at first, the thought is, wow, that must be, that must have been vandalism. And we realize later on, like, nope, that's the guy who's employed by this guy. That's what he decided. He's like, I'm going to put my writing here. Amazing stuff. But yeah, Fadalan is the reason that we know anything about this. So in the movie 13th Warrior, they have to show a, a montage scene where he learns their language. And I think it's one of the most brilliant pieces of cinema ever, because what they do is they show this man in the camp with the with the Norse, and every once in a while he picks up a word. He can hear one of their words. They'll be talking, and it's Norse, 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 and then all of a sudden, like you know, he slept with her while we took the horses. Like it's it's all of a sudden it breaks into English here and there, and finally when he learns their language, uh, there's quite a bit of shock and horror because some of them think that it's magic, that he can speak their language. And he's actually asked at one point, how did you learn our language? He says, I listen. And he, Antonio Banderas has a Hispanic accent because that's his native language. But it works kind of well in my mind because a lot of your, um, Travelers from the Middle East, uh, from the Islamic lands, were eventually became members of the Spanish court. Uh, I believe there's a gentleman referred to as Blackbird, uh, maybe 1500s, um, maybe or it might be in 1400s, or even earlier than that. It'd be good if you knew these stories by heart, Jay. Yeah, I don't know everything. Um, and he, he taught about eating asparagus and how to use utensils. You know? Wow, stop. So one of my favorite stories is the, uh, I had a friend of mine years ago tell me the story of numbers. And it broke my damn brain. So in, uh, when, when we run into, when the, when the Knights Templar first start in the Crusades and they're going to the Holy Lands, and to bring back information, people always talk about, well, what did they have? Well, it probably was arts and sciences, it's lost texts, especially lost scriptures of uh, lost uh, Judaic and Christian scripture um, was kept alive in that part of the world. Some of the other things they also added were like stuff like numbers. Uh, the Greeks were terrified of the zero, and they didn't use it traditionally, because the zero represented something without angles, and something without angles was not was not safe. It was outside of the realm of the world. And that may not make sense to you, but you have to understand that your Arabic numerals that you use now, the ones you were taught in school, are actually not accurate to what they originally were. Like a two would have, like that, it looked like a Z. Have two angles. A three has three angles. They're self-referential. You can look this up. And uh, yeah, I don't remember where I was going with that. But that's kind of neat. Hey. Oh, you 
Taking a break? realizing while I was doing this that you guys can't see I'm probably gonna block it anyway I'm working on the farmhouse right now and uh, I was doing it stop motion because I know some people just want to see stop motion stuff that's what they're interested in and I realized that you guys would probably like to see this a little closer as I get more comfortable with how this filming thing works and what it is I'm doing with the landscapes and how I want to communicate this, I'll get more into this stuff. You're going to have to be patient with me. It's going to take time. So. It's probably not as exciting because I'm not going to talk as much when I'm making these maneuvers. But it's definitely more concentration so I can't talk as much. So right now we're in, uh, everything's wet in this area. If I am not careful, I am going to screw something up and then I'm going to have to erase everything and start over. There's two ways you can deal with this. You can either paint it and sit on it for a while and wait until it dries and then go in and do the rest. Or you can say, it's just pigment on the surface. We can go in and make it, uh, make it the way we want it right now. Obviously, I chose the latter option. The reality is, it's kind of funny. Um, the person who lives in the building that I got the reference from, it's actually an old barn that's con been converted into a home. And it has this cute little light, Widow's Peak steeple element that has a light in it. It's just lovely. And uh, if you're wondering where this is, the actual house is in Hollis, New Hampshire. And we drive by it to get to work. And uh, I look at this thing and I just think it's the prettiest thing. A lot of people are like, I want my house to look like this. I'm like, I want my house to be a barn, man. If I could, I would do it in a second. I've talked about it a lot, my wife and I, and then maybe someday when we own enough land, we can, uh, maybe we can build the house we want, but it's not the most important thing. But, I feel like I need a long house, which is basically a post and beam or pole barn construction. They're, uh, they're technically cheap to build. They're incredibly strong, right? A house that's a pole barn is a, or a long house. Long house is kind of a similar idea. They're so inherently, sturdy that not much brings them down. Right here I'm just going to change the angle of that part of the roof to make sense. For me it doesn't make sense. Now it does. It's like the Vikings did a similar pole barn. They did long houses and you'd stick stakes in the ground just like a pole barn and they'd use green wood and they'd bend it and uh, they'd attach a lot of weight and bend and weight and this thing would cure over time in that position. It made for a very stout structure. Sometimes they'd even have, um, a lot of times they'd build them into the side of uh, hills. And so you'd have, you'd come out and you'd have your goats and your sheep on the top of your house eating food. Uh, that's not uncommon in northern climates. Uh, when my grandmother was a little girl, a uh, period of time that they lived in a sod house and she talked about it a little bit, that they had a sod house for a little while when she was very, very young. Went back to Ireland because my 
great grandfather uh, drank. And uh, and eventually they came back and uh, talk about horrible timing. She came back around the age of three and she arrived, you know, that would have been like the uh, mid twenties. So she arrived and you know, come back to see Mama and Papa. Uh, she came home and before she was 18, she lost both her parents. Cancer. Great Depression happened. World War II. It's just one of those things that's like, you look at things now and you're like, well, sometimes things are bad. Yeah, but they ain't. Great Depression, World War II, bad. They're just not great. Perspective is huge on that. When we were younger, we had this weird idea just because there was, there was not much information about it that whether or not she was born in Ireland or she was born here. And I still have weird opinions on that, but I'm going to go with what the records supposedly say, which is that she was born here. But I, I also would go with that because she was so incredibly proud that she was an American. She, she, she loved this country. Might be hard for people to understand that now, but she loved this country. In fact, at her funeral, uh, she, uh, one of her, one of the things they decided to do, I don't know whether or not she requested it, I didn't ask, I don't even know if I want to know, was, uh, her, one of her favorite songs was America the Beautiful. I feel like it's become this sad armchair elite educated bullshit attitude that any of that stuff is not worth anything and I hate that. God do I hate that. I don't like that it has become a hip thing to hate your own country. You know, every country on earth, unless it's like totally disconnected from what's going on, has at some point in time done things that are questionable or inappropriate. Last time you che I checked, you don't throw the baby out with the bath water, but maybe some people do. I don't. A lot of things that are wrong, a lot of things that could be fixed, but I refuse to buy into this weird narrative that we're guilty for all the evils in the world. That's just fucking stupid and ignorant. I also think it's a terrible byproduct of our 24 hour news cycle that they're always making up stories. I found this uh, app recently that they just share news from around the world. They don't pick it or anything. It's just, this is it. And the amount of news stories I hear in this thing that we don't even cover in the mainstream news here blow my mind. Sorry. So yeah, my grandmother was a uh, sod house for a little while, supposedly. And that makes sense in a Northern climate because Earth has a great insulation value to it, you know. If you've got uh, you got Earth on top of you, unless you're dead, you're uh, you're probably well insulated. I'll tell you that. So having a sod house, not strange, totally normal. Now people live in houses that don't make any sense, but they're told that they are supposed to look down on people who are somehow not. And all those people are primitive. What, they live in contact with nature and they have their feet in the ground? What savages they must be. Can't wait till I can do that shit in my own property. I'll tell you that right now. This weird idea that you have to put on uncomfortable clothing and go associate with idiots just to 
make your way in life is a terrible way to look at the world. I'd much rather, I would rather talk to a goat just about any day of the week versus your average individual. Or a cow. Oh yeah. So just like before, I just went in and I put this light element against where the back of the tree is gonna be. Trying to start to lay this tree in in the moonlight. Actually, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but if you've watched the video this long, when I talk about my grandmother, I'm talking about arguably the single most important human being in my life, except for my wife, sorry. I'll tell you right now, you, you lose someone that you're that close to, and people go, when do you get over it? I'll get over it when I'm dead. Not a moment sooner. I am kind of happy. This is going to sound dark. I'm happy she's dead. Because she lived long enough to see 9-11. And I think if she were to see what's going on right now, it would break her heart. She's also one of those wonderful people that way before it was acceptable to ever be who you are, i.e. be gay, she was very accepting. My great uncle Kevin was gay. We were always told when we were younger that people, I didn't know he was gay, but there was a lot of fucked up homophobia in my family. You know, I couldn't come out of the closet in front of my parents ever. Fucking sucked. I was told when I was very young that if I was found out that I was gay, I would not be allowed to be, see my siblings anymore. So it's good. If you really want to fuck someone up, that's a good way to do it. But my grandmother, she wouldn't like that. Her brother Kevin was gay. She didn't care if you were gay. If you picked on someone for being gay, she would, in her own way, she would stand up to that. She would very quickly correct you and explain to you that it does not matter what someone's sexuality is. It matters whether or not they're a good person. Sexuality has no bearing. That's none of your business what someone's sexuality is. You leave them alone. Live and let live. Need more of that now with people not agreeing with each other and attacking each other. We need a little live and let live. She came from a different time. She came from a time where, you know, you literally made do. And we used to call her, uh, she had a lovely house. Uh, unfortunately, when my grandfather and my grandmother both died, some armchair ass clown that just got their realty license decided to sell the property and fuck the whole thing up. Sorry, I'm not pulling punches though. Like. Your, your practice run to be a armchair real estate agent should not be selling my childhood home. But she lived to see 9-11. And as much as I was sad to lose her, I sometimes kind of wish she hadn't lived that long because then she wouldn't have seen 9-11. That, that's not my place to make those decisions. I ain't in charge of much. Her brother, my uh, my great uncle Kevin, spent most of his life uh, 
sure it didn't help being a closeted gay man back in the day. He spent most of his life um, studying. Uh, definitely, him and my grandmother probably both almost definitely on the spectrum. Um, and my great uncle Kevin read almost the entire Boston Public Library before he died in the early 80s. He missed a few bits of the East Wing. He hadn't gotten to it yet. He also had more master's degrees than any human being I've ever met. He did a lot of consulting work for places in Boston. When I went to study painting, I actually studied it under my grandmother's eldest brother, my Uncle John, great Uncle John. And uh, although we called him Buddy, that was his nickname was Buddy. And the kind of joke with my great Uncle John is like, any human being on earth who saw him immediately decided they had to talk to him, like they'd tell him anything. So he'd just be sitting on like the train in Boston and somebody would just tell him his, their life story. So he's everybody's buddy. It's kind of a, it's kind of funny. When I finally, because we're, we're all weird in my family, like when I finally went to school, that's when I met him. I didn't meet him sooner. I could have, I just weird and I didn't. And uh, I think I learned that from my grandmother because my grandmother and he lived only like, I think 25 miles apart. And in I think in 30, 40 years, they saw each other maybe two or three times. They spoke on the phone occasionally. There was no bad blood, they just, that's the way they worked. And so, it's kind of how my brain does things sometimes. If I don't hear from someone, I just assume everything's fine unless they need me and then they'll call me. I don't know what my disconnect is, but I don't like small talk too much, so. And so that was kind of how she was. Characters, warm people, genuine people, good people. Getting some of these uh, bushes in the front here. Bushes, trees, growth. I kind of, when I when I was doing references from this house to try to figure out how I wanted it to look, part of me was hesitant to put as much growth around it as I did. But I feel like when I have a garden, when I have a home and I have a garden, uh, I will want just Right near the house, I would like a lushness, a food forest, as my wife and I talk about it. I would like that to be right outside the back door, just wander into the food forest. I feel like that's perfect, you know, like... It always throws me off when people are like, oh yeah, we went to the, um... Went to this place, or... Saw, like, a greenhouse, or an arboretum, like butterfly exhibit or whatever, and it's like, yeah, it's so pretty. I'm like, well, why don't you do that in your own yard? But like, I just really like it. Yeah, I like it too. Why aren't we doing this? It just seems like work. What, to be happy? Sure, why not?
You're working wet on wet with paint. You can actually mix right on the surface if you are dabbing a lot. Because I am dabbing, I can I can mix on the surface. It's not out of the question. We'll throw this out there that when this is done, this will be up here at the studio until it moves on to its owner, um, whoever ends up purchasing it. So if I know COVID's a thing right now and you can't just come in, but if you want to see this in person, if you're in the area, you want to stop by and check it out, just drop me a message online. And uh, we will set up an appointment and you can come check it out. The uh, studio here at New Hampshire Tattoo is 709 Milford Road, Merrimack, New Hampshire, Penichuck Square. It lists a different address online, it sends people to the wrong place, so. So right now we're again putting in our light background, we're going to paint over a little bit. You'd be amazed at how much of this I'll, I paint over. It's, it's wacky at a certain point. When I was growing up, I, uh, there, was, there used to be a family farm and uh, it got sold in connection with some stuff and uh, abruptly because my grandparents had to move to a different town and uh, so they gave up their rights to the farm and depending on who you ask in the family it's either they were looking forward to doing it or they it broke their hearts it's hard to say um, I have trouble buying into whatever narrative because as with all things in life there is three so there are three sides to every story there's your side my side and then there's the truth and since those people are no longer here I can't ask them I can go off of the opinions of people I very much respect and I can listen to them but I, I can't truly know how they felt because they're not here but I know that they came from parts of the world where owning land was forbidden because of who they were. You know, back in the day, I don't know if people know this, but the Irish were indentured servitudes by the English a lot of the time. They weren't allowed to own land. They weren't allowed to keep their own crops. They weren't allowed to uh, speak their native tongue actually kind of funny, uh, so fair warning, I'm about to drop the F-bomb. Um, there's this uh, comedian who's Irish, and he says, I'm an Irishman and I'm forced to speak the English language. And the English language is a wall between you and I, and fuck is my chisel. 
I love that. Like the movie Braveheart when he says they're playing they're playing outlawed tunes on outlawed pipes. We can be angry about the past. We can be angry infinitely forever and it will poison our fucking souls. And that is a fact. Or we can remember that as terrible as the past was, it's exactly where it is. It's in the past and we can start building again. And, you know, I spent a lot of my life angry and uh, it just, it's exhausting at a certain point. It's just too much. You just can't be fucking angry anymore, you know? You can be angry about being a survivor of rape. You can be angry about, you know, what people do to you. You can be angry about all these things and believe me, I've been there. But, uh, it doesn't fix anything. The serenity prayer plays, plays into a lot of life. It's real important. You know? Being able to tell what the difference is between the things you can change and the things you can't and having the wisdom to know when not to try, you know? Right now we have to try. Okay, but next week when we do this, maybe we, this isn't the time to do that, you know? Maybe that's the wrong time. It's ultimately up to you, but... If you're trying to change shit you can't fix, then you're gonna be pretty stressed out. Most of the time I'm pretty stressed out because I feel like everything is wrong and everything needs to change and things are hopeless and it's all a travesty and it's crashing down around us. Although I've tried to explain this to a goat before and they don't seem to give a shit, so I, I'm not so sure it's real. <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of the pain and suffering that human beings have is shit we do to ourselves. I know that most of mine is just angry with the world, angry with myself, and at a certain point you're like, hey, it's a shit way to go through a day, man. That's true. It really is. You know, you can't can't change the past. But if you want to paint it, you can make it whatever the hell you want it to be. I can make a farm over here. I don't own a farm yet, but I can make a farm. And you know what? In my own way, I'm probably creating a challenge because I'm going to create inspiration for other people who want to go find a farm. And now I'm creating competition to get a farm. But what if it also means that those people who never thought of it before are all of a sudden like, wait a minute, maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe that'd make me happy. Well then, steal my fucking idea, dude, because we need a reconnection with nature. You know, I first got into that reconnection with nature, I'll say real quickly, was from hunting and observing the cycles and seasons of nature. And I, I'm a... I hunt the way I paint. I wander off somewhere by myself and I figure it out. Um, I don't like game cameras. I don't care about absolutes. I don't want to judge which buck is mine. And I have nothing against people who do. It's just not my thing. I want to go out. I want to hear nature. I want to talk to nature. If I really want to get an animal, I can find a way to do that. I think it's more important to have the conversation with the divine in nature understand as an animal what your place is and when you understand where your place is you might actually be able to understand what your happiness can be you know people I, I, I'm this and I'm that you know? these are all terms these are all ideas I love telling people that the first time my wife and I ever had a conversation, we talked about the fact that neither one of us I really identified as a gender we were assigned at birth type thing. Other people are like, well, you're trans. I'm like, I also don't like titles. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. This is kind of funny because I have an odd sense of humor. 
um, is that in the early 90s, I went to a pretty progressive public school, very progressive. Uh, and in the early 90s, we had this nice guy who, kid at my school, who started up a, uh, an LGBTQ, an LGBT, back then it was just LGBT chapter. And uh, I learned a lot about myself once he did that, because I had never heard those terms before. I didn't know what those things meant. I just knew that I liked things that other people didn't, or I was attracted to genders that some other people were not. I also knew that I wasn't necessarily a guy, but I couldn't figure out how to explain that one. And then this kid Colin starts up this group and he's like, LGBT, and I was like, the heck does that stand for? And he said, well, you know, he told me the T stood for transgender, transvestite. And I was like, I know what a transvestite is, what's transgender? And he told me and I went, well, I'll be damned. I think I fall into that category. I didn't know there was a name for that. The only thing funnier than that was, I also figured out how libertarian I am about 20 minutes later when I was, I had noticed that he was putting up these, uh, this is gonna rub a lot of you the wrong way and you'll get over it. Uh, or you won't, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> when I'm painting, I'm pretty honest. Uh, one of my friends, my friend Dan, uh, had made up signs because this kid was going around school, Colin was, he was putting up signs that said, homophobia is a social disease. And I remember looking at those signs and going, I think that's accurate. And my friend Dan put up signs that says, political correctness is a social disease. And I was like, yep, I also agree with that one too. Don't you want people to know who you are? No, I just want them to leave me the fuck alone or treat me like a human being. I don't really care what they use for words. It doesn't matter to me. Those are mouth sounds made by primates. And last time I checked, mouth sounds made by primates do not dictate reality. Reality is reality. I'm glad people make advancements in things. I'm glad there's rights. Don't get me wrong. I think it's funny people are like, well, what's your pronoun? I'm like, I don't have a pronoun, dude. Like, I am a monkey living in a meat suit that is animated by electricity. That's pretty amazing in my book. I don't really need a special name for it. It doesn't matter because no matter what I call it, you're still not going to understand my reality. We are chin wagging about something that no one can prove. It's way more interesting to just be in awe and be thankful that we are here and doing anything at all and try to make life easier by caring for each other. So, whatever hippie nonsense you want to buy into, I like it. There's our farm. Getting somewhere now, aren't we? I'm using a pretty soft brush. It's got a kind of messed up. I kind of like the messed up ones for texture. I'm going in right now and I'm just touching some of these, uh, these tops of these bushes. I'm leaving a little bit of opaque white intentionally because I want the color that I put on top of this to really pop. I want you to see a little texture. Remember over here is where we've got the moon. So we got this, this, the light source is coming down and it's sparkling, it's shining off of certain things. We want to give it that feel. I love, I love farm spaces. I just desperately love them. I think they're so pretty. Like dream farms, you know? They don't have to be real necessarily. I just like the idea that maybe someday this sits in somebody's house and it just makes them happy because they think about hanging out here or wandering their fields or maybe they go for a hike on the mountain someday or, or brush through the grasses to find like all sorts of neat little friends, you know? I 
hate when people laugh at that stuff. It drives me nuts. Because you always get people, oh, it sounds stupid. I'm like, well, I didn't know your dream died when you were eight. Sorry. I hate when it's hip to pick on shit because you think it's silly. That's so fucking lame. Well, it sounds kind of... Well, it's kind of goofy, you know? I'm not really into that. All right, well, like, happiness? Eh, whatever, fuck off. You know, so I don't understand, since I'm on a tangent and you followed me this far down the rabbit hole, is, like, why it's such an abstract or terrible thing for a man to show emotion about something. If you're happy, why can't you just be fucking happy? Why, why, why does it have to, like... People have to, oh, you're happy. Maybe you question your sexuality. Like, I'm happy. What does that have to do with anything? Human beings, man, they come up with weird shit. If we spent half as much time just trying to help provide and less time attacking each other, we'd probably get somewhere. And all the people are like, I want this done for me. I want this done for me. What the heck do you provide society with? And that's coming from somebody who's drawing pictures, you know, but provide something. Offer something to the world. If it's so bad that, the, you know, everything is being destroyed by greed and whatnot, what are you doing? Are you helping or are you hurting? Are you trying to bring joy and comfort to people or are you just bitching the bitch? You really want freedom, or do you want other people to tell you what your freedom is? I want freedom, man. I don't. I don't want anybody defining it for me. I want to define it for myself. It's supposed to be the great thing about this country is you're supposed to be able to be. In my lifetime, I've watched it go the other way. I've watched it become this thing where it's like, oh, you can't allow people to do that. Somebody will do something bad. I'm like, really? It's the last time I checked. People do bad shit no matter what they do. And it's not limited by what you give them access to. You don't make people better by telling them what they can't do. You make people better by leading by example as to what they should do. What the narrative that children see all the time. What's, what's the narrative they're seeing? Is the narrative that you you should be upright, you should be good. It's, it's appropriate. It's the right narrative, in my opinion. If your whole narrative is like what the world owes you, and all you do is sit at home and watch TV and bitch about how much you hate capitalism, what are you really doing? My two cents. I can bitch at home. I can do this. I want you to dream with me. I want you to come here. Wouldn't this be great if there was like a little street here and you and me and the rest of the Peanuts characters were going out trick-or-treating? That's a good time, right? suggest rows ever so slightly like I did before. So what I'm doing is putting down paint. this paint across very quickly, covering up my flowers. It's more important that I have direction. You don't even think you're seeing it, but you are. Crops have a direction. I'm going to patch it into that back field. I'm going to hook it up with my tree line.
And for a mid-tone, we're going to start to work fast because we're coming up on the crescendo here for the evening. And this area needed uniformity first. So we're going to go in and we're going to give it uniformity. Become, become a thing quickly. We're going to move forward with this. So I am putting down pigment. Let's see. This is going to get sketchy real fast. That's an art pun. Alright. guy I like to watch on YouTube. He's, uh, he's called the Farmhands Companion. And he does everything like old school Appalachian, like traditional farming techniques. And uh, he has some great stuff. But one of the things he says is that, you know, putting your vegetables in, putting your crops in a bed in perfect straight rows does not help your crops grow better, but it might help you sleep better at night. <laughs> I, I, I really enjoy him, he's a lot of fun. He also has this, uh, this sign in his workshop <laughs> that says, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like an apple. I cannot help, maybe it's brain damage, I cannot help thinking of that and giggling. Like, to me, that's one of the funniest things. I don't know why it's that funny, it just, it's just funny. I genuinely like it. All right, so, coming in on the crescendo here, we want loosely defined crop rows, we want a little bit of light shining. And don't you worry about how realistic it looks, because in about two seconds, I'm gonna do something that's probably going to throw you a little off. Oh, we're just suggesting... Right? Right? Okay. We're going to go in and we're going to grab our white. I need a big brush because this is going to get weird. I wish I had a drier brush, but I don't. Actually, I might. Nah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll try this one. All right, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna grab myself a bunch of white. Not perfect white, but it's much lighter. And I'm gonna go in here, and I'm going to connect some of this fog. I'm gonna kind of play with the fog in the background. I'm diffusing the rose, I'm diffusing the light. I don't need all that information, that is too much information for what this is. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like an apple. <laughs> awesome. All right, we're putting in more more fogs coming into the front. More mist. As I work, I am rotating my brush. So, 
Now, again, just like the other parts, this is providing background for the next thing. Dry brush. Hammering it. I want this fog to be a little bit more dense. Now this is pretty bland over here. This is not that detailed. There's a reason for that. When I get into this detailing and this foreground stuff, this is gonna draw a lot of attention. I don't want it at the same plane or the same depth as this, but it's almost into the same line here. Almost, it's close. Uh, it's this parallel, this parallel, this parallel, here, 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 here. Spiral. I'm moving you around the canvas or the board or whatever you want to call it. I want your attention here and then I want it here. I want you to be able to move around the piece. It's more interesting that way. coming across. I can almost feel the air moving it. The funny thing about agriculture, I think, when it's done right, is that you get these microclimates, all sorts of microclimates that produce effects with the weather, you know. Uh, you have enough plants, like I was talking about earlier, with the uh, white pine. You know, if you have enough white pine, you will change the, uh, the weather in that area. And the reason why is that the trees uh, protect the ground and cover the ground and they generate a way that the environment uh, picks up moisture, can drop off moisture, they direct air current. I'm not explaining this perfectly, I'm not a meteorologist, although I'm pissed at my guidance counselor that I didn't become a meteorologist. I'd love to be able to lie to people for a living and get paid millions of dollars to do it. Holy shit. Yeah, so I think I'd feel better if the rest of us weren't so dumb that we turned the meteorologist on and go, what does the weather guy say? Uh, usually nothing good, because he's lying.
closing in on the last minute or so. I'm just connecting these parts a little bit. It's not quite done, but it's not, you know, I've got a little bit of that fog creeping across the field. I have, you know, the suggestion of some of the crops there. when you're doing this not to rush. You want it soft, you want it right. All right. So I'm going to stop. If you're painting, okay, and this is important, this is this is something artists, this is for artists, okay? And uh, if you're learning how to paint, guess what? You're an artist. I don't give a shit if it's your first one or it's 5,000 painting, it's the same thing. There's a little voice in your head. You hear voices, Jay? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> There's a little voice in your head it's the same voice that you hear when it tells you don't do that, you're going to get it hurt. We're not going to jump off the roof of the house even though we're drunk because that would be bad. Well, that same little voice that says, hey, you know what? You're about to do something that's going to piss your wife off and she's going to kill you. Um, it's, it's good in painting at least, I think in all parts of life, but it's probably good to listen to that voice sometimes. So when I have a moment where I'm painting and my brain goes, that's as far as that's going to go today. You respect that and you go, good enough. Sometimes that happens. Uh, when I'm in a rut, it happens in five minutes of starting. When I'm feeling good, like I did today, it goes on for quite a while. So, get a rough and modest job just cleaning the stuff off the brushes, cap our stuff up, and uh, here's our our moon, our farmhouse, our field with crops, and uh, I'm going to back you out and I'll show you the whole thing. So, today we got our mid-ground, we've got our, like, fog, and trees and the fog is rolling in over the crops and maybe there's more of it over here and there's our giant white pines the magnificent king pine of the northeast and then what's left now is our foreground this is where our friends are going to go and i'll show you more about that soon thanks for hanging out and listening to me um i'm enjoying this process more than more than i can explain get to share this with you guys is, is very special to me and uh, it helps me uh, get out of this rut painting and to create wonderful things that make me smile and hopefully make you smile. All right, take care of each other and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get into the next session of this tomorrow and we're working towards a finished goal. Peace.